Hi, my name is Morgan Webb, and I have been graciously asked back to host another episode of Wow Source. And we have a really big show for you guys today. We're going to be talking about PVP with lead designer Ian Hazakostas and PVP designer Brian Halinka. And then there's a lot of class changes upcoming in the new expansion. So we're actually going to be able to talk to lead class designer Chris Zerhut, and he's going to give us all of the information on what you guys are going to be playing. So let's get started. You guys have a busy time right now. Yeah, exciting couple of days, exciting couple of weeks ahead. Uh, I think a as we speak, our alpha servers are coming up, and we're getting ready to kind of share what we've been working on with the world. And that's really just an exciting time. You know, since, since BlizzCon, we've really been hard at work and just polishing what we have, and just can't wait to show it off to everybody. And so what does that mean for you guys behind the scenes? Does this mean you guys are working crazy hours? Well, you know, some teams definitely are. Uh, I, I think, you know, this particular part where like a lot of information comes out is like a super exciting part for us because, you know, we're working behind the scenes, we're making a lot of changes, like we really want to share that with people. So it's really thrilling for us to like see players' reaction to a lot of the changes we made. Uh, it's really exciting time. One of the things, we've been playtesting this content internally for who knows how long, really, like since the day it was made, since BlizzCon, and we had this very iterative process, but we're really excited to finally share it with the world. I think one thing that we realized when we were playing it internally is that once players get a sneak peek of some of the alpha content, they may notice some pretty big changes compared to what was on the floor at BlizzCon. Actually, we took a close look at the starting experiences in those zones, in Frostfire Ridge, in Shadowmoon Valley, and it really wasn't measuring up to the standard that we wanted to deliver, that we knew we could do. And so we've kind of gone back and been iterating and redoing and improving some of those sections. And that, since that's the first thing players are going to jump into, that's one of the reasons why we haven't been able to kind of open it up and bring beta players in just yet. But that's what's coming, and we can't wait. We should talk. Oh, go ahead. Absolutely. We're really excited about getting the patch notes out, which are going out now. You guys are seeing this a few days later, but all the changes we've been making over the last year, a huge amount of changes to classes to streamline and make them play better, make the game more fun. And it's what I've been doing for the last year and a half. I'm really excited to see it go out and the players try it out. Well, we're going to talk a lot about that in just a little bit. First, we should talk about PvP. Um, you wanted to address some concerns that kind of came up in Mists of Pandaria? Yeah, you know, there's a couple of big questions, or excuse me, big problems that uh, we had in PvP that we really want to address, things that players complained a lot about. Uh, one of the first things was crowd control effects uh, in the game. There's just a lot of them, and they're really hard to understand. A player would just kind of go into a random battleground, and he's super excited to be there, he's got his new gear, and he's ready to start, you know, beating some heads uh, or capturing a flag, and then he's feared. And then he's pollied, and then he's cycloned, and then he's stunned, and then he's rooted, and then he's dead. And that really upset a lot of our players. So that was a very high priority for us going into Warlords. So we've done a number of things. Uh, one is there's a system that we have in our game. It's called uh, diminishing returns. And what that means is that when I stun you, maybe you'll get stunned for four seconds. If you're stunned again, the duration is halved. And if you're stunned again, it's uh, cut in half even further, and then you're immune for a certain amount of time. Uh, and this kind of prevents, you know, very degenerate things happening to you. But it's not a very clear system to players. Uh, all of our different spells are in different diminishing return categories. So we had, I think, 11 to 13 yeah, of them. Like, yeah. It was very complicated. Uh, and so we decided to really consolidate that down to five categories. Uh, we reduced the duration on certain con crowd controls, like fear, um, down to six seconds from eight seconds. Uh, we've just taken a lot of steps to make it a lot easier to understand and a lot uh, less abusive. Because, hey, we're all here to play our characters. We're all here to compete, and it's very important uh, that players are able to do that. Yeah. At the same time, though, crowd control, though it can be frustrating to have it used on you, we think it's a really important part of the overall tactical gameplay in, in PvP, in, in WoW. I think without, in a world without crowd control, players sometimes wish, you know, well, why don't you just remove Fear, remove Polymorph, remove these things? That would just turn into people dealing damage while healers try to keep someone else alive. And there's no variation, no ups and downs, no nuance to it. It's just, well, if damage exceeds healing, then you die. If healing exceeds damage, you never die. Crowd control is what lets you actually create windows of opportunity. You can stop the healer from healing you. You can you know, peel the damage dealer off your own healer so he can keep you alive, all of those things. But obviously, we need to strike a balance so that you have that bit of control, but you still get to play your character most of the time. Right, so we have it on the middle ground. We're not these special snowflake crowd controls like Cyclone that diminishes with nothing else. Now it diminishes with other things. There's not as many things that can hit you. You get control of your character back sooner, but there are those moments of opportunity created yeah. for a lot better gameplay. And certainly through the years, uh, diminishing return categories have kind of 
uh, led to a lot of our compositions for arenas, you know, players that have different classes that really mesh well together. So there are players who've been playing years like in those compositions, so we need to respect that. So we made sure that when we were shuffling all those categories, we were able to preserve a lot of the more popular compositions. I do like the idea of the snowflake crowd control, mm -hmm. the very special snowflake. Um, gear is something else that has really come up for you guys. Yes, it was a big problem uh, in MIST where we had a lot of different systems coming into play and we have PvE gear and we have PvP gear and they have very different needs but we want to provide some degree of crossover in the game. You know, we think it's very important that players uh, are able to come into the world of Warcraft and explore every part of the world of Warcraft. And what often happens is players start to kind of tunnel in one area. I'm a PvE player, I'm a PvP player, and they just don't want that other area in their game at all. But, you know, for us, we think the real value of this game is being able to take your character and do a wide assortment of things. Um, but we still want to address the problem where, you know, PvP gear out in the world, it was at a bit of a disadvantage uh, throughout uh, Mist of Pindaria, more towards the end uh, than the beginning. Uh, so we're doing something different with our PvP gear uh, in World Lords of Draenor. Uh, now, uh, we really want it to be clear when you're comparing two pieces of gear to say, hey, which, which of these two pieces of gear is better? So uh, all the PvP gear in Warlords of Draenor will have a second item level that activates whenever you're um, in PvP, whether it's in an instance battleground, arena, ashran, or whether someone tries to gank you in the middle of uh, questing. So, you know, for instance, uh, a piece of gear may have an item level of like 550 normally, but it has a PvP item level of uh, 590. So as soon as somebody hits you, all of your stats increase, and uh, you're, you're able to take them on a little bit better. And we think this, this bridge is a nice gap for us, where that gear is still useful in other parts of the game, but when the time comes uh, for you to actually do battle in PvP, we can make that gear the best. I mean, I think our big picture philosophy there has always been that we want crossover, but we also want the gear and the rewards obtained from one sphere of the game to be the best thing to use in that sphere of the game. Yeah, you've actually uh, brought us a little bit of content. You have some new content, Ashran. Tell us a little bit about what we're seeing. Well, uh, Ashran is uh, one of the new things we're doing in Warlords. You know, PvP has kind of always been about random battlegrounds, which are instant content, small game modes and whatnot. But we've never really kind of embraced this world PvP, this persistent battle between the factions. And that's something we wanted to kind of bring to Ashran. It's an island off the east coast of Tanan. And when a player first goes there, he'll kind of be introduced to the zone. In a way, we want it to be similar to the Timeless Isle experience uh, in uh, Mists of Pan area, but for PvP. It's a PvP playground. So a player should be able to go in there, uh, explore the island, beat on some heads, kill some creatures, and earn things that will give them a benefit in the PvP game. Um, it's really exciting. Um, we've done a number of things to allow it to be a, a balanced experience where we tie a number of servers into the same instance. So players who might be concerned about alliance horde imba uh, imbalances, uh, we're going to make sure that we do our best to ensure that both sides have an equal opportunity to come into that zone. Um, the overall theme of the zone is that the uh, Horde and Alliance have landed on this island, and are, it's a, a, an ancient ogre island. It's kind of a, a savage jungle, just like uh, Tanan, and uh, players are kind of doing battle in an environment that they've never really done uh, battle in before. So you actually brought a map. This is a work in progress. Yeah. This is not the final thing, yes. uh, but what are we looking at? So this is one of our early paper designs for Ashran. Uh, it kind of shows the theming that we're going for. Uh, what you see is at the top is a horde base, the bottom is an alliance base, and those are two fortresses on either end of the island, and behind them are these staging areas. Our vision for those staging areas is it's kind of an area that you go to to duel or go to the vendors or kind of place for the PvP players to hang out. Um, but then once you go kind of up the hill or across the bridge, you're in the thick of it. Um, the fortresses themselves are manned, they're like actively in combat and full of uh, NPC characters that are Horde and Alliance uh, fighting a battle. Down in the central road is where the main part of the fight is going on. Uh, on both sides are Alliance and Horde uh, fighters and they're battling out each other, slowly pushing up and down that uh, road to each other's fortresses. Out around the outside of the island are a number of objectives and players can go there to do a number of assorted uh, different things, whether it be kill quests or you know being uh, some type of tribute to a, a local uh, you know 
forefather or something like that. Things that provide players benefits uh, for their rewards, getting honor faster, getting gear faster, things like that. But they also reinforce uh, the entire kind of theme of the entire island, which is a faction battle between the two of them. So one thing that's important for us is we don't want this to feel too much like a battleground, like a giant battleground. It's most it's supposed to be about exploration and PvP in a wide open and, and unstructured environment, but we still felt like it was important for us to provide kind of points for the player to go to and perform different activities. But those activities are just kind of kitted in a faction battle sense. They're not specifically a battleground. Like, we're just not trying to make a giant battleground. And our player is going to be able to test this out? Yeah, it's one of the things we're definitely excited to share and bring alpha players into on our servers. Um, we're still working on polishing up the experience, so it's not going to be available in the initial builds. But down the line, we definitely want to get players in there. One of the things we're doing with our alpha testing process this time around that we've never been able to do before is actually have a separate alpha realm that is a max level only PvP environment. Kind of like our tournament arena realms, except just in the Warlords beta alpha environment. So we be level 100 characters only. Most of the rest of the world will be turned off, but you can jump right in with pre-main max level characters, PvP gear, hop into Arena, Battlegrounds, and Ashran, test out those mechanics and give us feedback. Traditionally, as we do our alphas, we raise the level cap progressively as content unlocks. And because that's partly because we need you to test the content at an appropriate level. But what that means, one of the unfortunate consequences of that has always been that we don't get to max level PvP balance until the very, very, very end of the beta process. This time, we really want to kind of have an end run around that limitation so we can get better data, better feedback right away. We're actually also going to use some of the same sort of tech to start testing our raids and dungeons earlier on as well. Um, so that even when the level cap on Alpha is 92 or 93, if you zone into the Blackrock Foundry raid, we'll boost you right up to level 100 so you can test one of the encounters, we can get our feedback, we can get started making it perfect for you guys. And one thing I've learned from being around here is that you guys will be watching them, people. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Um, let's talk, uh, we're going to take viewer questions in just a second. Um, let's talk about skirmishes. Yeah, one of the things uh, players have always missed uh, from the game is what's called skirmishes. This was a way for players to get into our arenas without much consequence. Uh, they could queue for things, uh, queue for it, and they could queue solo, and they could just go try out arenas, try different classes and whatnot. Uh, the problem is right now, rated arenas, there's always this cost, right? So if I'm, you know, super high rated, because and, you know, someone else, uh, my friend, he's like a 1500 or whatever. Uh, we bring him in. Uh, you know, it's, if we lose a game, I would lose a significant amount of rating. That would make me sad and make everyone sad. Um, so when we're bringing back skirmishes, it allows players to get into arenas and allows solo players to get into arenas in a way they never have before. You know, a solo player can queue for them, just like a solo player can queue for random battlegrounds. Uh, they'll be matched with another player, uh, whether, you know, if they're a healer, we'll match them with DPS or, or vice versa. Uh, they play the match, and at the end, if they win, we give them kind of a random reward. So they get a, a basically a bag or a, a personal loot roll, and, you know, we either give them honor, we give them a piece of battleground gear, you know, it might even very rarely be a piece of conquest gear. Who knows if we're feeling, if we're feeling generous. Uh, so uh, it, it, I think it's a really exciting thing uh, for a lot of players. Uh, what we've always seen is that because random battlegrounds is a solo queue experience, a lot of players do them. A huge, one of our most popular things in our game. Uh, I think um, skirmishes being a solo queue experience will allow a lot of new players to get into arenas that have never been there for, before. So really think it opens doors for players uh, who've always kind of wanted to do arenas, uh, but never really had the friends who are willing to do it. All right, you guys want to take some questions? Sure. sure. All right. Uh, Idealis from Dentarg, do you feel the blacklisting feature for Battlegrounds worked as intended? Well, you know, I certainly think that the intent of the blacklisting feature uh, was for players who maybe didn't like a certain battleground to not have to play it. And in that respect, it certainly met its intent, right? Like if you opt out of a battleground, you're not going to play that battleground. I think there's some concern in the community that that feature lends itself to some of the long queue times we have in the game right now. Um, but it's really not true. The, the feature is used by maybe 20% of the people who queue for uh, random battlegrounds. Uh, overwhelmingly, everyone is just queuing for everything. Uh, the real problem that we have is uh, one of faction imbalance. In some regions, uh, there's a lot more horde queuing for random battlegrounds than there are alliance. And as a result, uh, the queue times are very long. So we're doing some things to, to try and fix this. Uh, it's just 
not a simple problem to fix. Um, I know people say, oh, well, just let me, you know, switch sides for free. Well, even that is very complicated because <laughs> everybody's got a guild, right? So uh, there's a lot of options that we're exploring. Um, we think we have some good ideas and uh, we want to do it in a way that's uh, right by our players. Um, so that's definitely something we're working on. We have Simer from an EU realm and unnamed. Is threat generation ever going to be a concern for DPS players again? Sure. Um, yeah, that's so. I think threat generation is something that has kind of evolved in its importance over the history of WoW. Way back in vanilla Burning Crusade, threat was this sort of hidden mechanic that was essential to playing a DPS class successfully. If you did too much damage, the boss would turn, hit you once, and you were dead. And so you had to constantly push your feint button if you were a rogue, feign death on cooldown if you were a hunter, or or whatnot. I think. Over time, though, we realized that, and a tank's primary job in that world was to generate as much threat as possible. Over time, we realized that the threat gameplay, while it could be interesting for a tank at times, wasn't something that we ever really could communicate particularly well through the base UI. It was just that you know you were getting close to the mob getting angry enough to want to hit you, but there wasn't weren't any exact numbers that were visible. You had to use um, third-party add-ons or UI mods to actually make it manageable. But ultimately there wasn't much that you could do if you weren't the tank to control or contribute to the system. If you were playing with a tank as a damage dealer who wasn't generating as much threat as they could or as, as you might want them to, all you could do is actually kind of throttle yourself. Just take your hands off your keyboard for a few seconds, stop pushing buttons, stop doing damage. That, that's not why you're playing a mage or you're playing a rogue if you're playing those classes. You're doing that because you want to blow up the dragon, not because you want to wait three seconds between fireball casts, lest the dragon get mad at you. So we've, over time, we've, we've moved away from having tanks be about generating threat and more towards tanking being about survival and keeping yourself alive. Because I think that really is the core fantasy of what people imagine when they think about playing the tank class. You want to protect your friends, you want to be the one who you know, commands the dragon's attention, and then you raise your shield to deflect his flame breath. You do all of those things. And in the meantime, damage dealers can do what they're best at. So we think ultimately that's something that lets everyone have fun. So I wouldn't expect a return of threat mattering tremendously anytime soon. Uh, MON from Zuljin. Will there be any punishment for players who enter a random dungeon group and fail to perform slash pull their weight? I think the wording there, <laughs> punishment is an interesting way of wording that question. I, I think that we care tremendously about making sure that players in our dungeon groups and other random matchmaking groups are having a good experience. And certainly it's possible that people stumble into content that they're not quite ready for. And we have gates in place that check your gear. And one of the things we're going to do with our heroic dungeons in Warlords is actually, if you want to randomly queue for a heroic dungeon and be randomly matchmade with a group, we ask that you've proven your ability to play your role to a certain extent through our proving ground system. But that's also a system that will hopefully let you learn and improve. I think there's just general misconception among players that when you see someone in your group who's underperforming in your own subjective perception, that clearly it must be malicious. They must be griefing the group. They must be trolling. They must be you know, AFK making a cup of coffee for themselves while you're doing all the hard work. But in reality, a lot of people are actually still learning. They haven't necessarily played WoW for nine years. They might have only played WoW for nine weeks. And there's a lot for them to learn. We want to make sure that we can teach those skills. But at the same time, we do agree that it's important. We don't want to place players in frustrating situations. So it's something we think we have good solutions for going forward. I mean, we're looking forward to doing more work on the Proving Ground system, too, to make it better at teaching you how to play the game better. It's one of those features that we may not have at 6.0 launch, but we will be adding as the expansion proceeds more ways of teaching you to play better for each of the roles. So I think once people have played a long time, they assume that it's common knowledge how to do some of these things, and yeah. it's, you know... And they'd be yeah. surprised at what they don't know and the expert players do. Right. Mm -hmm. It's always right. very enlightening when you right. just go play another class and you're like, oh, wow, I didn't know all these things about this class. And it kind of puts you in that other person's shoes, which is nice. Yes. That should be a good prescription. Walk a day in the mage's <laughs> shoes. Um, okay, let's talk about class because there are a lot of class changes coming up. Um, what is the philosophy behind some of the changes? So. The big problem we have with WoW right now is there are just too many abilities on Ruby's bar. Over the course of the expansion of the years, we just keep adding new abilities and adding new abilities, and now like there's not enough room fun, on. it's fun, right? On, you know, <laughs> adding it's abilities fun. is fun. It was exciting well, when you got that ability, yeah. but <laughs> now it's like my brain is full, my action bars are full. I don't know what button I'm supposed to push, and we also have a lot of buttons that are 
redundant with each other. The two different buttons that do very, very similar things are buttons that are very, very situational. So we focused on finding those redundant and situational buttons, cutting those out, and streamlining the class in a way that reduces the complexity but keeps the depth people love. So uh, a good example of that is like you have on Warlocks, they have Drain Soul and Drain Life. We got rid of Drain Soul. Drain Life is enough to do the, to do that fantasy, that particular role of of, uh, of draining life from the creature when it's about to die. Um, another good example be, be, might be on, on Feral Druid. They had Mangle and they had Shred. Shred only works from behind. Well, well, let's simplify this. Let's have one button that doesn't have position requirement and you only have, that's one more key bind on everybody's action bar that plays that class. So in all the classes, you'll find there's one or two buttons you used to have bound. And ideally, you're like, what, what did I used to have there? I don't know. I'm not sure what I used to have there. And just go on and keep playing the game and be happy you have more space on your action bar. We really want to keep all the depth but reduce the complexity and the mental space required to play the game. We're talking about a little bit uh, before this about keeping that player fantasy. Yeah, really important when we're cutting those buttons is keeping the fantasy of what your, your class is on. And even, even more, sometimes when we decide what button to cut, we say, well, is that, is that button really important to how it feels to be that class, the idea you have in your mind of what, what it is to be a warlock or a druid or a shaman. So we're keeping the core fantasy. And in some cases, by cutting buttons, we're able to make the, the fantasy even more distinct. Or there's a cases where we simplify buttons, like uh, Rogue's Tricks of the Trade. It's this button that's intended to use to pick up ads and make them go attack the tank, but what it also does is increase the damage of the target. So most rogues create a little plan while the rogues tricks of the trades on each other, <laughs> and it, it contaminates the core fantasy what the button's about. So we simplify it, and it, it, it doesn't cost any more resources, and all it does is the threat transfer. It doesn't increase damage anymore. Some people might be sad to lose that, but it makes the button much more about what the button's purpose was. Or uh, Swift Mend on Druids. It's just an instant heal. It's not about putting mushrooms on, or efflorescence on the ground anymore. Um, there's something else that does that for you. So finding ways to redesign the buttons to keep the fantasy as pure as possible. Yeah. And it's also worth noting that you know we want to get, continue to give players new things when appropriate yes. that enhance their experience, make them excited to play their class, and make a fire mage feel like even more of a fire mage, make a priest feel like even mm -hmm. more of a priest. But in order to do that, we need to free up a little bit of room. Yep. Because at the end of the day, if you're sitting there with your action bars full, every key that you can think of near WASD or ESDF <laughs> if you're one of those people. I don't know right. about that. But if you're one of those people, fine. Um, if every key is filled with a key bind, well, where are you going to put this thing? You're excited about the new button, but then it's tempered by this nuisance of like, ah, oh, control shift three? Okay, sure. <laughs> right. And that, that's really not and what we want to And you're not going to use that anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're not going to use control shift three. Or you're going to try to and use the different ability. Yeah. Like, I blew the cooldown, <laughs> I didn't want to blow, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I find a lot of people who like they deliberately and they pick their talents, they pick the abilities that won't give them a new button because they're trying to avoid this problem. And that's a sign that we have too many buttons. Mm -hmm. Now, reducing these buttons is definitely make room though for us to add new things in the future. So they should expect there's gonna be a little bit of, you know, we take something out, we put something in to keep the game in a healthy space mm -hmm. in the future. And anecdotally, just like in our play tests, when we like try out a class mm -hmm. that I play on live and then I come to one of these tests, I'm just it's amazing. And I'm like, oh it's it's like I, I don't have to have the amazing dexterity to play this character anymore, but I'm still, you know, the fantasy that I'm trying to pursue is still there, and it's really nice. Now, you actually brought us some new animations mm -hmm. that haven't been seen before. So as part of uh, redesigning the talent tree, so our new level 100 row, uh, we, we took a look at strength of the fantasy on mages. So the level 100 talent row features some talents that are specific to each spec. So there's a fire mage only talent, a frost mage only talent, an arcane mage only talent. So we have meteor for fire mages, we have arcane orb for arcane mages, and we have comet storm for frost mages. Um, we actually did something similar with the level 75 row, which used to be the three bombs. And a lot of people said, I don't want to have a bomb. So we took those three bomb talents, we merged them into one talent, and that is now specific to each one. So only fire mages get living bomb, only frost mages get frost bomb. And it made some room for some new talents there as well. So we introduced supernova and uh, ice nova, and also brought back blast wave for fire mages. So there's more spec-specific stuff in all the talent trees. Mage is just a good example of it, but all across all the talent trees, each spec has some talents that are unique to their spec to make you feel like more like you're playing that spec's fantasy. It's also worth noting, um, as you look at some of these visuals, these look incredibly epic, mm -hmm. but bear in mind something that we've been very cognizant of on our end is also the problem of visual clutter. It's cool when the mage, as the mage, when you're casting this, but when you're casting Meteor and a huge ball of fire is being called down from the heavens and incinerating your enemy, less cool when you're the rogue and there's three mages behind you and they're dropping balls of fire on your head and you actually can't see anything that's going on mm -hmm. and then you die. So we're making sure to kind of tone down some of the visuals from your allied players so that they're not obscuring the important things that you need to see while still making sure that when you yourself mm -hmm. are channeling some epic ability against your enemy, it feels pretty epic. Yep. 
you see the visual, but your friends don't have to see all the stuff that you see. So you get your cool fantasy, they get still get to see the game and play the game. And for PvP, you know, we still show everything because a lot true. of that stuff is very important yeah. uh, to know the state of the game and know what people are casting. Mm -hmm. So we made sure to preserve that, except for, you know, in giant battles like an Alterac Valley or something like that. I'm just excited because I can stop getting tweets about Blast Wave. That's <laughs> yeah. what I am so yep. pumped about. People want it back? Yes. Yep. <laughs> And now people know how to get to you. Yes. Just tweet you. <laughs> eventually so. you'll I didn't do it though. It was... Eventually you'll cave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have some questions about classes. Uh, Valgon, if you get into a situation where you have to make a decision about buffing a class, either for group or solo play, which criteria are the most important ones your decision is based on? Um, for PvE, we mostly look at what is your what's the performance we're seeing on average on the live server. So if a class is underperforming, like enhanced shamans are doing low damage, we'll find ways to, to, to buff them numerically for, for PvE content. In a, and we try to do that in a way that's not going to create problems for us in PvP. So we're always consulting closely with Brian, like, if you make this change, is it going to make them overpowered there? No, it'll be fine, you can do it. Or, oh my god, don't do that. We scare him a lot. <laughs> yes. He's not, oh no, no, don't do that. That's frequently the response we get from Brian. So. I am I'm enjoying imagining that response. <laughs> don't touch yeah, that. One of, <laughs> no, 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 no. one of my favorite moments from the last couple of months was explaining to Brian exactly how the multi-strike stat was going to work on Elemental Shamans in conjunction <laughs> with the Echo the Elements talent and Elemental Overload all of which have a chance of, of duplicating, replicating your spells, such that sometimes as a shaman, you could push lightning bolt once, and theoretically, like, nine could come out. I curled up into the fetal position. <laughs> and so but it's, like it's very unlikely. Well, it's not dependable. Random death touch is fun. <laughs> <laughs> What's the problem there in PvP? Come on. Yeah. Okay, yes, we, we, we toned that down a little bit. Yep. We fixed some things. I think one of the misconceptions, though, is that, like, I'm the only one who cares about this yeah. stuff, but like... Do we all care? You know, a lot, they do. Like, everybody cares. The whole team cares about PvP. You know, sometimes things get considered... I'm not even in the room, and they're, they're shut down for PvP. So, you know, Chris, his whole team, Ian, all these guys have been making this game a lot longer than I have, and they care a lot about PvP. So, uh, it's helpful. It's, it's a tough problem. It's, it's something we think is important to try and, yeah. like have mm -hmm. a game that's consistent across both PvE and PvP. Mm -hmm. That's the key thing. Like, with a lot of these situations, it would all, like, the easiest answer sometimes would be to just divide the rule sets yeah. into two parallel versions of yeah. every spell, every ability. But we feel it's tremendously important just to keep the game feeling accessible and unified that when you cast Fireball, it works the way you know Fireball works. Mm -hmm. You don't have to learn this whole separate set of rules, this whole separate yeah. set of interactions when you go into a battleground, when you go into an arena. So even though it adds an additional set of constraints, where sometimes we have to deal with the fact that, you know, this class is not doing so well in arena, but they're dominant in raids, yeah. how do we give them more damage? Right. Well, we, we come up with solutions we, for those. We find intangible because, things, because like it's movement worth it. speed or more outs from crowd controls we, they, to help the PvP player. But we want, we want those two parts of the game to overlap. We've been working towards that since the very beginning. Um, if anything, our changes in this expansion are more and more about trying to get people who haven't done PvP in a while to go back and try it again, to keep those two together. So different rule sets would only damage that. And, you know, there are times when it happens, and we feel like it's necessary to make some PvP-specific yeah. mm -hmm. rule. And, you know, we just, we strive to not do that. Mm -hmm. You know, we strive our very best to kind of prevent that from happening, but it happens. It's a last resort. Uh, it is an absolute last resort, but when we feel like it's the right move for the game, we yeah. do it. I mean, Polymorph turns a, <laughs> a creature into a sheep for like a couple minutes, yeah. turns a player into a sheep for eight seconds. Sometimes, but, I, I, sometimes I don't think people appreciate like all of the yeah. things that are actually in the game that are mm -hmm. two rule no, sets. Yeah. CC durations are a great example. Mm -hmm. um, we have things uh, like a, a passive buff for healing and damage, uh, resilience to kind of tune those specific things for very good PvP gameplay. Although resilience is going on. Right. Yeah, but right. we're reducing them as much <laughs> as possible. I, I, yeah, we're, we're bringing them down because it doesn't feel good to, right. like, cr you know, hit a creature for, with your obliterate for 300k and then, you, you know, hit a player for 80k. Right. Uh, of course, also item squish. But anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's there's a lot of things we're doing to kind of bring the game closer together. But at the same time, you know, we we, we do make an effort to, uh, to, to differentiate them when it, it's necessary. Right. Another part of that question that the, the viewer had was, um, what about classes that are unpopular? So, one, like, we've noticed over the years that rogues have some degree of unpopularity. They're one of our less played classes. So we often try to find intangible things to make the gameplay feel better, to strengthen the fantasy. So a great example of that was in, in Mr. Pandaria, we took the, the speed penalty off of stealth. So rogues can move full speed while stealth, and that felt cool, it felt awesome. So we look for things like that when classes are less popular. Not, not making their numbers higher, not making them gods at PvP. It's more about making them yeah. more fun to play. 
Because again, like we know we can make something popular by making it overpowered. Right. But that's the easy way out, and that's not yep. sustainable in the long run. I think the bigger challenge is to you know, find other ways of solving those mm -hmm. problems, getting people to take a fresh look at something and give yep. it more of a chance. All right, those are all the questions we have. Do you Great. guys have any final words for the viewers about the Alpha? Anything you guys want them to notice or check out while they're there? Well, I, I'm just super excited. Yeah. I think we all are that mm -hmm. uh, people are going to be playing the game uh, and giving us feedback. I think it's just important, you know, get out there, play the mm -hmm. game, give us feedback. We're listening. Uh, a lot of the things you tell us, you know, they really do impact the changes we make. So, yeah, I think at the end of the day, you know, part of the part of what Alpha means, it, we're sharing mm -hmm. what we've been working on for you know the past year and a half with you guys, but we're also listening. And this is our first pass at things. You know, mm -hmm. we cut a bunch of abilities in terms of ability pruning. I'm sure that some of them are going to be your favorite abilities. It would not surprise me if one or two of them get added back. It would not surprise me if we take a fresh look at some of the decisions we've made mm -hmm. in the light of players interacting with them. As much as I wish it were the case, not every single design we have works out perfectly on the first attempt, but we'll get there. So the more feedback we get from you, the better it'll be in the end, the better the game will be when it goes live. Exactly. Perfect. Well, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. And we hope to see you back for the next episode.